So you're working in the emergency department and in comes in a 75 year old gentleman who comes in with a chief complaint of, for some reason, I can't feel the right side of my face and my left arm doesn't move very well. Sure enough, this patient appears to be having a stroke. So as we do with all patients who come in with stroke-like symptoms, we activate our stroke protocols and get the CT scan revved up and ready to go. This patient gets a very rapid CT scan as well as a CTA that shows no visible occlusion that they're able to see, no LVO, nothing that shows a huge bleed. So as you get back to the room, you've already told the nurses to go ahead and get that TPA lined up, ready to go. Everything seems like it's heading towards a stroke. So we know that this person is probably going to need some alta place in terms of the management according to the national stroke guidelines. However, as you were beginning to get ready to start the infusion, the patient's symptoms magically disappear. The patient says, I don't feel those symptoms anymore. My left arm appears to be working okay. The right side of my face appears to be working okay. You do a stroke assessment on him again. His NIH stroke scale is now a zero as his stroke symptoms have all completely resolved. Now, in this circumstance, what do we do next? We have this patient certainly has risk factors. He has a history of hypertension. He has a history of coronary artery disease. So we know that he has some atherosclerosis. We look at his age and say, well, he's definitely an elderly gentleman. Is this somebody we want to bring into the hospital? And in this circumstance, we know that the hospital may or may not be the best place for these patients. So what do we do with this person who appears to now have had a TIA? And that is what we're gonna talk about what risk scores can we use? And the Canadian risk score, is it better than EBCD2, which is the commonly used risk score that we do use? So when we think about patients who come in with a TIA or a transient ischemic attack, the big thing that we worry about is, is this patient going to subsequently have a stroke later on? We know that these patients are at a much higher risk for developing a stroke as a result of their TIA. How high? Well, that risk varies. At seven days, it's anywhere between 0.2 and 10% of these patients will go on to subsequently have a stroke within seven days, depending on which study that you look at. And then at 90 days, again, that number goes up even higher, 1.2% versus 12% who come in, have a TIA, will have a stroke at 90 days. Oops. Now, in terms of what do we do with these patients, we obviously can make it very easy to, to just admit these patients to the hospital. The question becomes, what happens to these patients once they get into the hospital? Oftentimes they'll get carotid artery imaging, they'll get a, a, an echocardiogram to look for a patent for amino valley, they'll get uh, an MRI to ensure that they didn't have a small infarction that may not have been seen on the initial imaging. But a lot of that workup is most of the time negative and they go home within a day after they have had their complete risk factor modifications go home on dual antiplatelet therapy and will most likely go home and follow up with neurology on an outpatient basis. But we know that our hospitals are full up with patients, especially after this pandemic, we oftentimes felt that our hospital was this kind of breeding ground for just people just stay in the hospital for prolonged periods of time. And as a result of that, a lot of us experienced these, these scenarios where our hospitals were full and we didn't have anywhere to put these patients. So they oftentimes boarded in our emergency departments to get their work up in the ED and oftentimes sent home. So what risk scores can we use to risk stratify these patients who've had a TIA to see if they are at higher risk for developing a stroke? Well, the very common one used by all, almost all of neurologists started off being the ABCD score. And this was a study that was published in 2005 that kind of started and derived this ABCD score. And we know that ABCD stands for the age, their blood pressure, where the systolic blood pressure was greater than 140, or diastolic blood pressure was greater than 90. The clinical features that were present, did they have unilateral extremity weakness? Did they have um, aphasia or any type of facial paralysis? And then how long did those symptoms last? Did they last 10 minutes? Did they last longer than 10 minutes? Did they last longer than 24 hours? So a lot of people looked at that scoring system and said, I think we can do better. 
So what Johnston did in 2007 is he combined the California score with the ABCD score and came up with this, der derived this score, which is the ABCD2 score. This ABCD2 score has added on all of the usual ABCD things and then added diabetes as the other D. And as a result of this, this is actually the most commonly used risk stratification score for patients who've had a transient ischemic attack. Some people thought that this even wasn't good enough though. What about imaging studies? CT, diff diffusion-weighted imaging, usually with an MRI, became some of the commonly used imaging studies for patients who've had a TIA. And if patients were found to subsequently have any type of infarction on CT scan or even small infarctions on diffusion-weighted imaging studies, they were found to be at higher risk, which turned out to be the derivation for the ABCD2I score. And what this did is that if there was any signs of infarction on the CT scan or on the diffusion-weighted imaging MRI, that patient got an additional three points added to their ABCD2 score in those patients who subsequently had higher risk for developing a stroke in the seven-day period. Now, when we look at these scoring systems, do these scoring systems actually work? Well, this is a, a study that looked at the California and the ABCD and the ABCD2 scores and found that this really wasn't that useful. In these, in these um, studies, the, all three of these, these studies, there was not found to be any type of real useful use of the California or the ABCD or the ABCD2 score. They didn't very well risk stratify patients into the low risk or the high risk categories. Subsequently, on top of that, patients who were found to be high risk according to the ABCD2, ABCD2 scores were oftentimes found not to be at significantly higher risk for stroke, nor the patients who had low risk scores did they subsequently have a significantly lower risk of having a stroke as well. And similarly, Jay Perry and all looked at the ABCD2 score in terms of a prospective validation. The ABCD2 score was derived in California. This was the study that looked at the validation of this scoring system in Canada and found that it really wasn't useful again in terms of risk stratifying patients very well. So what do we do in these circumstances? Well, we can rely on a neurologist to make our decisions for us, sure. So I asked a neurologist friend of mine if he felt like he would be able or be available for consultation on every single patient who came into the emergency department with a TIA. If I could just call him up and say, hey, I have a patient with a TIA, what do you think I should do with this patient? And this is how he responded to my question. Yeah, I don't think I'm going to do that. And most of us live in the scenario where the neurologists are not going to be significantly helpful. The patients have no symptoms. They're gonna say, you know what, you can either admit them or you can have them follow up with me on an outpatient basis. Well, who are we gonna admit them to? So I asked my medicine colleagues as well, how would you feel about admitting these TIA patients to the hospital for a TIA evaluation? And this is what they responded. Absolutely not. There is no way in the world that I'm going to admit these patients who certainly need a neurologist. I already admit all the ortho patients, all the ENT patients. I am not going to be the admitting grounds for every single patient who needs a subspecialist service. So what do we do with these patients now? Well, here comes Canada to save the day. Canada came up with a scoring system that I think is actually a little bit more useful than the ABCD2 score. And the same group, the J. Perry group at all, <clears throat> came up with this Canadian TIA score. Now, the Canadian TIA score admittedly is a little bit cumbersome to calculate. As you can see, there are lots of different things. These are the clinical features that the patient experiences and their point systems associated with it, as well, as well as the clinical data that's associated with these patients in terms of using and calculating this score. What they found is that this is something that we should be able to use on all patients across all systems. But as we know, in terms of risk scoring, we need a validation in order for this to be actually clinically applicable. So, that study came out in 2021. This was a prospective validation of the Canadian TI score. And they actually compared this scoring system with the ABCD2 as well as the ABCD2I scoring systems. 7,600 patients across 13 emergency departments in Canada. So they used the scoring categorization that 
Anything negative three to three was deemed low risk, four to eight was deemed medium risk, and anything nine to 14 was deemed high risk. And what they found is that patients who had a low risk, there was about 16% of the patients who fell into that category. The large majority of patients who came into the emergency department with TIA who were found to subsequently have a Calif I'm sorry, a, a Canadian TIA risk score in the medium risk was that 72%, the largest proportion was in the medium risk category. And then high risk, there were about 11.6% of patients who came into that risk category. And subsequently, they were found that low risk patients had a very, very low incidence of stroke. Less than 0.5% of those patients were found to be in the low risk Canadian TIA risk score. Around 2.3% were in the medium risk and then high risk was much higher, obviously 5.6%. So how do we use this comparing to ABCD2 versus ABCD2I? What they found is that the Canadian TIA score actually did a better job of evaluating the low risk patients and actually getting them potentially out of the hospital. The ABCD2 and the ABCD2I actually were not able to identify any low risk patients according to their scoring system. So all of the patients who were subsequently in this validation study were found to be in either the medium risk or the high risk scenario for the ABCD2 as well as the ABCD2I scoring systems. So the Canadian TIA risk score was much better at being able to evaluate those low risk patients who were potentially able to be discharged home. So what the authors of this study actually proposed as an algorithm for management of these patients was that patients who were deemed to be low risk could get a simple non-contrast CT scan in the emergency department and subsequently have outpatient follow-up. Anybody who is in the medium risk would need a non-con CT of the head as well as a CTA of the head and neck to evaluate the vasculature. And then they needed rapid follow-up, usually within 24 to 48 hours would get an MRI with neurology at that circumstance. And then high-risk patients would need a non-con CT of the head, CTA of the head and neck, and then a neuro console in the emergency department. And they, those patients were at higher risk and certainly would most likely be admitted to the hospital. Now, in this study, they didn't admit a lot of these patients to the hospital. 5.8% of these patients were admitted, which means almost 95% of these patients were still subsequently sent home. That's across all of the risk categorizations. Now, a lot of people have problems with this study, and for, first and foremost being that this is a study that was all done in Canada. The entire thing was done in Canada. But one thing I always like to remind people of is that Canada is the fourth largest country in the world. So spreading this across all of Canada certainly has some implications in terms of, is this the same patient population across the entire, the, the entire country? And obviously that's not the case. But the other thing is that Canada has universal health care. And so as a result of having that available to them in Canada, they're able to establish that very quick, rapid follow-up with neurology. So is this something that can be applicable in the United States? In order to do this, we have to have all of our consultants on board. Neurology, radiology, all are going to need to be on board with getting outpatient follow-up for these patients. So this may not be applicable in the United States yet, but certainly is something that we can consider in the future. So until that external validation is done, this is something that still should be in the back of our minds, but may not be useful as of yet until that external validation has been done, as we've done with the previous studies before. So what do we do with these TIA patients? Well, I think this is something that we should be considering is this Canadian TIA risk score in terms of risk stratifying patients to find out what should be the management algorithm for this patient population who is certainly a higher risk for stroke, but doesn't necessarily need to be managed in the hospital. So my take home pearls from this talk, number one, the Canadian TI score has a much, much, much better risk stratification protocol than the ABCD2 score, which is the tried and true method that we've been using in the emergency department. So we should probably shift a little bit more away from the, from the ABCD2 score. Second, this score may not be completely applicable yet, certainly depends on what resources are available, but certainly if you can have outpatient follow-up established quickly, this is something that we can use. And until we get external validation, this is something we should have on the back of our minds, but that external validation, as I'm aware, is certainly certainly being done in, in, in an emergency department somewhere. And if it's not, maybe this is an opportunity to, to do one. So thank you for having me. And as always, I'm welcome to answer any questions during the Q&A session.